Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Mayor Thomas P. Koch, I would like to welcome you to the State of the City Address for 2021. First, I'd ask you all to please rise for our Pledge of Allegiance. This morning, the pledge will be led by Quincy Police Officer Melanie Reeves. Officer Reeves is a 1995 graduate of Quincy High School and served our nation in the United States Marine Corps from 1996 to 2002. She rose to the rank of sergeant and was the recipient of two Marine Corps Achievement Awards prior to leaving the service in 2003 and joining the Quincy Police Department. She is now an 18-year veteran of the department, serves as one of our DARE officers with our young people every day, and is a member of the QPD Honor Guard. Officer Reeves. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Officer Reeves. Thank you for your service to our country, and thank you for your ongoing service to the city of Quincy. Um, everyone could sit now. Pledge is over. We do have uh, a good number of elected officials with us this morning, although somewhat less than we would normally have. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce those folks. Uh, Councilor at Large, City Councilor at Large, Noel DeBona. Ward 1 City Councilor, David McCarthy. Ward 2 City Councilor Anthony Andronico, Ward 4 Councilor Brian Palmucci, Ward 5 Councilor Charles Phelan, Ward 6 Councilor William Harris, and school committee members with us today, uh, school committee member Paul Bergoli, school committee member Frank Santoro, school committee member Catherine Hubley, school committee member Courtney Perdios. From our state delegation we have with us today, State Senator John Keenan. Do I see, I thought I saw Representative Ayers. Uh, from our county we have with us today, Treasurer Mike Bellotti, uh, Sheriff Patrick McDermott, and Register of Deeds Bill O'Donnell. Okay. I do see some former elected officials in the audience as well today. Uh, former state treasurer, former city councilor, currently the president of the Quincy Chamber of Commerce, Tim Cahill. Uh, former Ward 4 councilor, Tom Fabrizio. Former school committee member and city councilor, Michael McFarland. I think I just about introduced everyone. So that is everyone. And with that, it was a great privilege for me to introduce the mayor of our city, Thomas Koch. Good morning, everybody. Before I begin with my formal remarks, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank Chris Walker, my chief of staff, Helen Murphy, my entire staff, our city department has department managers. This year has been an extraordinary one, and each of them have stepped up incredibly with their time and their passion for the city, so thank you to them. Also, usually my family's joining me at these events, but this year is a little different, as we know. So I know my wife is watching at home, my biggest critic, but also my biggest supporter. Uh, my son, Cornelius, uh, Officer Coke now, proud of him. My daughter, Abigail, who recent graduate with her Bachelor of Arts, I'm certainly proud of her. And my son, Tom Jr., who's on his last deployment as a United States Marine. So it's, uh, it's about uh, one in the morning, I guess, tomorrow for him. So he may catch up with this at some point. So thanks, Tom. So thank you for being here this morning. This is certainly not the normal setting, as I said, for the way we usually gather, but as you well know, this has been anything but a normal year for our community, our Commonwealth, and our nation. I particularly wish to thank my colleagues in local government, particularly our city councilors and school committee members. Some of you are here this morning, I appreciate you being here, but thank you for your tireless work on behalf of the people of Quincy. 
Your diverse perspectives and your counsel to me personally is truly greatly appreciated. You show each and every day skill set you bring to the table and your passion for the city, and I'm grateful. These are among the most challenging times the early and recent history, but it is within these challenges when we saw and continue to see clearly the kind of place Quincy is. The perseverance of our people, our values, our willingness to help each other. The state of our city, despite the long shadow of the last year, remains strong. And it remains poised for the future. We did not let the pandemic paralyze this community. And we're not going to let it stall progress in the coming months. There's much work ahead. But I can say with great confidence that this city and its people are prepared to emerge from this crisis as strong as any community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. While we gather today in confidence for our future, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the members of our community taken from us by this horrific pandemic. They were our family members, our neighbors, our friends. They were community leaders, teachers, coaches, veterans. No one in this community went untouched in some way by the loss inflicted by this horrible virus. And it did not just take lives, it took away our ability to grieve and celebrate as we normally would the lives of those we lost. So let us spend a brief moment in silent thought to remember those members of our community who died over the last year and for all their loved ones robbed of the opportunity to gather, mourn, and remember. What we did know then is that the city of Quincy would dedicate every available resource to meet this crisis head on. There can be no doubt that what we did and continue to do today were meeting those challenges. We provided more than a million dollars in emergency housing assistance for our hospitality and personal service workers, the ones most seriously affected by the economic fallout of the pandemic. We provided more than 2.5 million to nearly 400 small businesses to help them get through the very worst of the economic storm. This made possible by flexible language in the federal stimulus package by our own Congressman Stephen Lynch. We provided tens of thousands of dollars in assistance to overextended food pantries. We waived hundreds of thousands of dollars in permitting fees to help restaurants get back up and running. And we created a simple and flexible streamlined system for expanding outdoor seating which became a model for our region. We've invested millions of dollars into our school buildings and millions more to ensure that every single Quincy Public School student had access to a laptop computer for remote learning. We budget conservatively and wisely, allowing us to prevent any layoffs of city or school employees while maintaining property tax levels below the state average. This stability created by vital assistance provided by the leadership of Governor Baker and our state legislative delegation, Speaker Mariano, Senator Keenan, Representatives Ayers, Chan, and Hunt. We understood that protecting the most vulnerable members of our community, those who cannot protect themselves, must be a priority. Working with our clinical and social service partners, we implemented a testing and depopulation plan to protect our homeless that prevented the kind of widespread outbreak that had taken place in several other cities. The actions of this partnership include Manor Community Health Center, the South Shore YMCA, and Father Bill's Place quite literally saved lives. I also want to thank former City Councilor Joe Finn, President and Executive Director of Mass Housing Alliance, for his guidance in this effort. It is this kind of collaboration at the heart of our pandemic response, and we've had so many of our employees, residents, organizations, volunteers, and businesses step up to do amazing work over this past year. From our public health nurses, Caitlin Pico and Taylor Picarara, Commissioner Jones and our entire health department team who bore the weight of triaging the most severe public health crisis in more than a century. 
to our firefighters and police officers and essential workers who never missed a beat, school superintendent Kevin Mulvey, his leadership team, teachers and staff forced into an upside down world but never losing focus of their singular mission to educate our young people. Our business community, President of the Chamber of Commerce Tim Cahill proactively volunteering to manage the housing assistance program, business leaders like Jim Dunphy, the president of the South Shore Bank, which donated all of the bank's proceeds from the federal stimulus loan program directly back to businesses here in Quincy in the form of grants. Corporate citizens like the Stop and Shop Company and Brewster Ambulance providing vaccine to our senior and low income facilities as we gather here today. Our social service agencies like Quincy Community Action Programs in interface social services faced with unprecedented demand in delivering critical lifelines of food, clothing, housing, and support to those in need. As we move forward, we must be mindful of the disproportionate toll this pandemic has taken on those who can least afford it. The poor, the underserved, and those afflicted by the epidemic of addiction. In this community, we've never taken a back seat to anyone when it comes to confronting the addiction issue. We know that the pandemic has exasperated the suffering, and we must be prepared in the coming months to redouble our efforts with partners such as the Gavin Foundation and Bay State Community Services. I want to take a moment to offer my sincerest gratitude on behalf of our entire city to one particular partner today. They've been with us every step of this pandemic, the team of Manit Community Health Center, led by CEO Cynthia Sierra, who joins us here today. They perform truly extraordinary work on the front lines, from testing to treatment, and now to administering vaccines to thousands of our residents who may have never known Manit, by the value of the Community Health Center now intimately familiar with their work. First and foremost, Manit is there for our underserved populations, those of neighbors with the least amount of access to health care. But in this time of crisis, Manit immediately stepped up to become an indispensable partner serving every single person in our community. So thank you, Cynthia. Thank you to your team, a group of tremendous professionals like Dr. Lily Young, Kim Kroger, Ray Lee, and Kim Ross, all of whom responded bravely, took on far more than their regular responsibilities, and performed with great compassion when their community needed the most. And then there are the dozens of volunteers, people like Bob Griffin, Roseanne Russell, Lucy Mao, Jane Casilius, and Poe Ling, who give their time solely because their time is needed. This city could not ask for a better partner. Thank you, Tamana. As we move forward, our work with Manit will expand as we continue our unique, innovative vaccination partnership. Today, Manit is administrating more than 1,000 doses of vaccine per week, with more than 70% going to residents who have never used Manit before. We know the operation needs to grow. In the coming weeks, we'll continue to pursue every avenue to expand what we can offer locally. While I can make no firm commitments on supply, I can firmly commit that we'll do everything possible and dedicate every resource available to administering vaccine to as many people in this community who want it. This spring, we'll continue to do our part to get the economy rolling, continuing to provide resources and assistance to keep businesses and restaurants open and creating hundreds of jobs with a broad range of major infrastructure projects and hundreds of millions of dollars in new economic development. It's worth noting that working together with our friends in labor, developers, contractors, and our health and safety teams from the city, that we're able to continue construction safely throughout 2020 and did so without any major job-related outbreaks. Through the collective work of so many, we struck a balance that protected the health and safety of workers and at the same time saved literally hundreds of jobs and kept scores of our families free from the threat of poverty. Striking that same kind of balance looms as our most important remaining pandemic challenge, getting our young people back in the classroom full time. This has been an extraordinarily challenging and frustrating year for our kids, our parents, and our schools. The Quincy Public Schools, its leadership, its staff, its teachers, has performed extremely well amid the circumstances. I would not trade what we have in Quincy from the community to the school system itself with any other city in town. There are many different perspectives on the best path to full-time classroom learning and when. As I've stated publicly before, I believe we can do it very soon and do it in a way that instills confidence in our teachers, 
our staff and our parents that it's being done safely. We're making progress. Under the direction of Superintendent Mulvey, his leadership team, and the school committee, our kids were in hybrid faster than most other districts, and our youngest students have returned sooner than most. I know that's too slow for some and too fast for others, but I fully expect that every student in Quincy will be back in the classroom, or at least have that option in the coming weeks. As opening our schools must be our highest priority as we beat back this pandemic, I want to focus much of my talk today on Quincy College, another educational institution that must also be a priority for our future. Quincy College is the only municipally owned community college in Massachusetts and one of the very few anywhere in the United States. It was founded more than 60 years ago as a simple innovative extension of our Quincy Public Schools, often referred to as grade 13 and 14. Since that time, it grew, it flourished, and at times it struggled. It has, however, always created the kind of opportunity at the heart of the American educational system. It lifts people up. It provides promise for those who could not seek a degree without working full time. It creates a path to the middle class for so many in our underserved communities. It makes attaining a degree possible for those who otherwise could not afford it. Half of our students are people of color. Students claim citizenship from 81 different countries. And two-thirds come from income levels that qualify for financial aid. In short, there is no greater force for equality in this community than Quincy College. It is a great light of possibility and it is a vital part of what the city will be in generations to come. That is why today I'm calling for a renewed sense of purpose, renewed commitment and a renewed investment to secure the future of Quincy College and secure the future of countless of our young people in the coming years and decades. The challenge is both internal, internal and external faced by the college over the last several years are no secret. But through interim President Pilotti and now President Richard DeCristofaro, Chairman Paul Barbador and the Board of Governors, the school is well on its way toward a path of stability and growth. In a little more of the year in the job, Dr. Dr. DeCristofaro has brought to the college that same tenacity, the same commitment and the same fundamental understanding of what works in education that made the Quincy Public Schools one of the best anywhere in Massachusetts during his 19 years tenure as the superintendent. The college today is on much firmer footing than it was not long ago, but hurdles remain. The city must be a strong partner in these transformative efforts. I spoke earlier about the college's unique connection with the city, but there have been times in the not so distant past when the connection was not necessarily looked upon favorably, that it was somehow a detriment and that the college should weaken its relationship with the city or even sever from it entirely. To the contrary, I believe wholeheartedly that the city must strengthen, not weaken its partnership with the college because we have an undeniable responsibility to do so. The college is a city department. Its faculty and staff are city employees. If the college should cease to exist tomorrow, for whatever reason, the city and its taxpayers would own all the obligations owed to its employees, such as pension costs and health cares, just as we would for any teacher, firefighter, or laborer would also be responsible for any leaseholdings that are out there. So we are committed and invested in this institution. The college is not isolated, it's not standalone. Its failure would cause a tangible, painful ripple throughout our local government. And that's why we have a clear, vested interest in ensuring its stability and growth. Over the last few years, the city has done more to acknowledge this unique relationship and contribute to the college's long-term stability. That will continue this spring when our administration files an appropriation request with the City Council to fully fund our outstanding pension liability by including the college, their own pension obligation as part of this proposal will save the college approximately $30 million over time. The financial protections provided by the city will allow the college to continue its efforts to stabilize and help to create the kind of flexibility necessary to expand programming, shore up the existing cohorts, and eventually lay the foundation for offering four-year bachelor's degrees. When the college thrives, so does the community. 
The broader economic benefits created by the college cannot be ignored as we move forward. The school contributes nearly $50 million to our local economy every year. It contributes to almost 600 jobs and employs more than 100 Quincy residents. That's money spent in our downtown coffee shops and restaurants, it's contracts and services with local companies, it's the primary source of income for many Quincy families. The idea of an institution of higher education driving a local economy is not a new one. Take Cambridge and Somerville. That's the only analogy I'll make with Cambridge and Somerville, but there's cities that derive almost their entire economic life but from the higher education. The more the college grows, the more it succeeds, the better it will be for our local economy, for our local companies looking for a diverse workforce, and for companies looking to locate where they know they can find diverse, talented workforce. The workforce linked to the college has always been a core part of its mission, and never more so than today amid the pandemic that has caused the loss of tens of thousands of jobs across the Commonwealth. I'm proud to announce today that the city, through its Federal Community Development Block Grant, will provide a $430,000 partnership with the College and Mass Hire South Shore Workforce Board. It will provide 120 low-income residents who lost their jobs due to COVID, free certificate-level training in fields such as healthcare, finance, human services, and substance addiction counseling. The program in partnership with agencies such as Manit, South Shore Hospital, and Beth Israel Milton Hospital will also help create an additional 44 full and part-time jobs. This initiative will benefit a neighbor who perhaps lost her job last March at a local hair salon, but has not been called back. Perhaps a single mother who had her hours slashed waitressing at a restaurant. The family scraping by on benefits with maybe two parents who've lost jobs. The power of education to lift up those in need is limitless. And this one small program is a symbol of the opportunity that Quincy College creates as part of its core mission. The path the college creates from the classroom to the workforce in the middle class is not anecdotal. It is real. Born out in the data, a 2019 study by Georgetown University showed that graduates of Quincy College based on the tuition they pay, can expect to earn more over the life of their careers than graduates from any other community college in all of New England. That return on investment extends to those students who go on to secure bachelor's degrees, with Quincy College graduates earn earning more after 10 years than all but one other public institution in Massachusetts. This truly outstanding value created by the college will remain its philosophical foundation in the coming years. But as we've talked about, the college also needs a physical foundation of bricks and mortar. Our work to build the school, its first permanent home, will continue to move forward this year. And I'm pleased to announce today that I'm naming College Governor Catherine Craven to lead the new Quincy College Building Committee that will shepherd this vital project from beginning to end. There is no single person in our entire Commonwealth who has more experience in leading the construction of new school buildings than Ms. Craven. Currently the Chief Administrative Officer of Babson University. She previously served as the Executive Director of the University of Massachusetts Building Authority, where she oversaw nearly $4 billion in capital improvements that transformed the campuses of the UMass system. And prior to that, she was Executive Director of the Mass School Building Authority. During her time in partnership with communities across the state, she led an $11 billion renaissance of school construction. We look no further than the block down on Coddington Street to see the new Quincy High School, and several blocks north to see Central Middle School to see the product of her work under the leadership, of course, of her then boss, State, state Treasurer Tim Cahill. Governor Craven is with us here today. Look forward to our work ahead in providing the college with a state-of-the-art educational facility of its own for the very first time. Thank you, Catherine, for taking on this responsibility. The connection between the college and the community is not purely about governance and finances. It's about the students. In the recent past, too many of our Quincy residents have chosen other community college and too few have enrolled at Quincy College. I saw it every year reading the list of our graduates from North and Quincy, always asking myself, why would any kid 
from our community choose a different community college. Today I'm proud to report that we're on course to change that thanks to the leadership of Dr. D and Superintendent Mulvey. Already dual enrollment programs are expanding and this year the college is offering three pathway programs in early education, information technology, and legal and protective services. These allow students to earn Quincy College credits while still in high school. And in the coming weeks, we'll announce a major new pathway program funded by a foundation grant. This initiative will provide low-income and underrepresented students attending North and Quincy a powerful route to post-secondary education. The early college program will identify our high-need populations, build on those existing high school to college pathways, and offer at no cost access to college credits and a promising avenue to their associates, or bachelor's degree. Does that mean my time is up? <laughs> Quincy College cannot thrive simply as a college in Quincy. It must be Quincy's college. And that means continuing to do more to draw our students here. That means expanding current programs. It means creating new ones. It means working in close partnership with the Quincy Public Schools. And it means offering tuition reductions and other incentives to keep more of our students right here in downtown Quincy. I greatly look forward to continuing to work with Dr. DeCristofaro in the Board of Governors on all of these efforts. Our own Abigail Adams, resting just across the plaza where her husband John once wrote, learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and diligence. Let us use that same ardor, that same diligence to ensure that Quincy College can provide that place for learning that place where opportunity is created not by chance, and that place where a diploma not attained by chance truly does become society's great equalizer. My friends, there'll be a temptation for some who in the coming months look at what we're trying to accomplish at the college and other areas like infrastructure, public safety, preserving our history and economic development and say, maybe we're trying to do too much. I say instead, let us remember the words immortalized by Abraham Lincoln. Leave nothing for tomorrow which can be done today. So my friends, let us continue the journey together, asking God's blessings on all our endeavors, and may he grant us peace, peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, and peace in the world. Thank you and God bless you.